Okay. Um, I'm Evelyn Ami Mensa, and I'll be your moderator for this meeting. And before we start, if you see that your colleague is on the meeting, kindly send them a message or call them to join because this CPD is all of us. We really need to learn from each other. So I'll give us like, then we can begin. Thank you. Okay. Good evening once again. Welcome to today's meeting. We'd like to Mr. Mark Nord. All right, thank you very much for the opportunity. Can you please hear me? Okay, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be guided as a body to study. We pray that your spirit will be with us and grant us understanding. We pray that you empower the speakers to teach us. In the name of Jesus, we pray with thanksgiving. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Today's CPD is a part of this CPD. His knowledge and respect to, to also keep our mind in action. Um, play me. It's in my voice. Is it better now? Okay. Mm. Better now. I wanted that um, um during the presentation. Also, do you think that
Hello. Yeah, this is Evelyn. So I'm using a different device. Um, okay. That is okay. Better. I was saying, okay. So I was saying that, yes, we should treat this online meeting as an in-person. So we should avoid doing every other task. While the presenter is on, um, so we'll, we'll learn what we are supposed to learn here. Um, so moving on, our speaker for this evening is a committed lecturer with over 10 years of experience as a dietitian. He's also into teaching. He also trained nutrition and dietetic students. So assist other health professionals with the management of patients with acute and chronic dietary related diseases. He holds a Bachelor of Science degree in biochemistry chemistry, nutrition, and he holds from East Ghana. He is going to the University of Science and Sciences, Department of Nutrition. Sorry, it's asking for this meeting. I appreciate him. Andy Jonah, please, we are ready for you. Hello, RD. Exactly. Hello, Evelyn. So, how did you know? Are you hearing me? Hello, how did you know? Hello, Evelyn. So, Ari Jonah, I, I think that Evelyn may have a challenge from her end. Please. So, if you are yes. ready, just go ahead and share your slides. That is fine. Yeah, I do have the power to share. That's it. Okay. Mm -hmm. you, you don't have the power to share? No, uh, I think I, it's coming. Uh, yes. uh, can, can everyone see? I, I can see. Okay, that is fine. 
So I can go ahead. I think you should. All right. So let me thank the executives of the Volta OT and Eastern Region Gand for and also the national executives for giving me this uh, privilege or opportunity to walk members through the topic medical nutrition therapy for diabetes current trends. And uh, as uh, Evelyn, uh, um, as Evelyn uh, introduced me, my name is Jonathan Anan Asari. Um, so this will be the outline of my presentation, a uh, brief introduction, looking at the importance of diabetes, why we need to help our diabetic patients manage their condition uh, uh, very well. And then we we'll take a look, uh, a quick overview of uh, what diabetes is. Um, I understand a lot of us have gone through or have been seeing diabetic cases. So we'll just go quickly over the diabetes is all about. And then our main um, 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 top, top, uh, topic, which is the MNT, we'll take a look at the dietary and lifestyle management using the eight dime format. Okay, so I'll walk you through that and then we'll draw conclusions. So by way of introduction, globally over 500 million adults have been affected by this disease. And this is statistics that is coming from the International Diabetes Federation, the latest on the website. It also states that the number is predicted to rise to roughly about 600 million by the year 2030 and about 780 million uh, uh, by about 2045. Okay, that tells us about that tells us how serious this condition is and that we all need to put our will, our hands behind the wheel to help manage our cases for our clients very well. And in Africa, around 24 million adults are said to be living with a condition. Okay. And three out of four adults with a diabetes live in low middle income resource countries, including Ghana. So that should also let us up our game or make us increase our, our expertise when it comes to managing uh, the, uh, our patients. Over one in two people living with diabetes are also undiagnosed, about 54% of that. That tells us that, again, a lot of people are out, but, are on, but do not know there is any health facility for checkup. So, again, awareness creation is very key for us to be able to manage uh, that group of and six um, diabetes is responsible for 6.7 million in 2021 meaning that among the diabetic population for every five second or every uh, for yes for every five second one person dies out of that condition or due to that condition and diabetes is also responsible for about 400,000 deaths in 2021 on the African continent alone. Okay. And in Ghana, the death toll rose from 6,108 in 2011 to about 6,300 thereabouts in 2021. Okay. So all these statistics tells us how important it is for us as dietitians and nutritionists to help reduce the death toll okay, that is occurring due to uh, uh, um, um, diabetes impact on our patients. Okay, so it is very, very important for us to help our patients come out of this uh, predicament. Um, sorry. So let's take a look at the definitions for diabetes. And I'm sure we have uh, come across this definition before, but as a recap, we're saying that Diabetes is a lifelong condition that causes a blood sugar level to become too high. And so it is a metabolic disorder with a characteristic being hyperglycemia, that is chronic high blood sugar with disturbances in carbohydrates, fat, and protein metabolism. And all of this is due to the fact that there is a defect Okay. 
them. So, Audi, um, I, I think the network may be unstable. I'm not sure if it's from from your end, but there's a lot of breakage in the delivery. I don't know if anybody else can confirm that. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, it's true. So it, it will yeah, help if you, could, if you could reposition yourself so that um, the participants can, can maximize the, the the reach, okay, I think he's dropped off. Um, apologies for the technical hitches, but I'm sure he'll join back again. Samuel, would you want, do you want to say something? <laughs> Your microphone is, is, is constantly unmuted. Do you want to say no, something? Okay. No, just about the network, I wanted to complain. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Evelyn, you are the, you are the host, so go ahead, the moderator. Go ahead, if you want to say anything. Hello. Hello. Yes, Evelyn, I can hear you. Okay. And please, I lost connection. So please, can you come again? So I was saying that you are the moderator, I believe. So. I had the impression you wanted to share some yes, information. Yes, please. Um, but RG has, has also lost connection too. I want to believe he's reconnecting. Wow. Yes. yes I'm not please. sure what the network situation is in the region, but it appears it's not too stable at this time. Recording. Yes, yes, please. But if you have an announcement, it's a good time to 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 share those announcements so that okay. Whilst we wait for RD Jonathan to join back. Okay, so now for now there is no announcement, but I would like to engage us whilst we wait for Aldi Jonah to join us back. Um, I hope we have all gotten in touch with our colleagues to join the meeting because this meeting has been made for us to attend and to learn from each other. Um, so moving on, I would like to ask some of us, what are some of our expectations for this meeting? And even though RD has begun, I would like us to know what, what, what we expect to learn at this CPD. So please, you can raise your hand, I will call you, then you share with us your expectation. Hello, I hope you are here with me. Yes, yes. Okay. So please, would you like to share with me your expectation for this CPD, Madam Pell, Bansa?
or I should call out names? Hello, I think my expectation is that I should know the new trend in the management of diabetes and the modern types that we have now. Aside the type one and two, I learned there is some new type that has come up. That is my expectation. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Madam Pelbansa, for sharing in your expectations with us. And we hope that at the end of this CPD, they will be answered. And please, any other person to share with us what they expect to learn at the end of this workshop. It's a workshop, so everyone is supposed to cooperate and contribute. So let us know what your expectations are. So Adi Jonah is back. I'm oh, sorry. Adi, this you're internet. welcome. Hey, thank you, thank you, thank you. So as I was saying, these are the three main classes of diabetes that we have. Type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and gestational diabetes. Of course, there are other uh, forms of diabetes. I will talk briefly about them as well. But we all know that among these three, um, type two seems to be the common, the commonest, okay? And it affects about 90 to 95% of the population. And with that one, it occurs because the body does not produce enough insulin, okay? Or the body cells do not react to the insulin that is produced. And so a lot more people with type two diabetes tend to have insensitivity to insulin. Okay, so that's why you have insulin resistance being shown on the slide and then relative insulin deficiency. They may be able to produce some amount of insulin, but it may not be enough to be able to work efficiently to clear the blood of the extra glucose that has come in for fuel production. Okay, then again with type 1, there is absolute insulin deficiency because it is an immune mediated for type 1A or for some type 1B, we say there's no known cause, so idiopathic. That the, the, body, the patient's own body cells produces antibodies against the islet, of, uh, the islet cells that produces the, 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 the insulin. Okay, so it destroys the beta cells of the pancreas for that matter. And then for gestational diabetes, this is glucose intolerance with first onset or recognition during pregnancy. And this usually occurs between the second or third trimester okay, of the, a pregnant woman's journey. Okay. And the secondary diabetes may include what we call drug-induced or chemical-induced uh, uh, um, diabetes, where you have long-term use of medications such as steroids okay, or some of the Chemo, chemo, chemotherapy or medications that are given to treat uh, HIV AIDS patients. And these people, for long-term usage of these medications, they may end up with the secondary diabetes. Again, when the exocrine function of the pancreas is impaired or is diseased, so you have um, inflammation on the pancreas or pancreatitis on your hand, it is a secondary diabetes condition as well. We also have maturity onset diabetes of the youth. Moving on, I have a small activity for us to, to do. I will want us to mention some of the most common risk factors of type 2 diabetes. This one, we can type them in the chats. Okay, so I'll use about, say, two minutes for this task. Yes, I'm waiting. Any common risk factor of type 2 diabetes that we know? All right, I see family history. 
obesity. Um, yes, obesity again. Physical inactivity, lifestyle that is very broad. If you can break it down for us, um, and then age, yes, uh, pickles, yes. Um, so there are several of the risk factors for diabetes. That tells us that there is no one particular cause for diabetes, especially, especially the type two diabetes, which is more common or which is more commonly found uh, in the population. And then any of these risk factors, are they modifiable? So yes, I see that in the chat, some of the risk factors that have been uh, enlisted, we have uh, modifiable factors in there and also non-modifiable factors. So for the non-modifiable factors, we say that yes, um, family history, as was mentioned, if you have a parent, or a, 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 a two of the parents or a, just a parent having the condition, you may end up with the condition as well. Age, which we cannot do anything about, especially as we increase in age, this is due to the fact that there's a deficiency of insulin secretion, which develops with age and growing insulin resistance caused by the change in our body composition as we age. Again, race, research has shown that the black race or the African-American uh, is highly prone to catching this uh, condition. And then history of gestational diabetes. Yes, if a pregnant mother uh, is diagnosed of having diabetes and they are able to put to bed successfully, if they don't take care of what they eat, they may end up uh, getting type two diabetes also coming up. And then history of impaired glucose tolerance and impaired fasting glucose. These are the people we call pre-diabetics. Yes, if you have a history of that, you may end up uh, catching the disease as well. Then for the modifiable factors, factors that you and I can do something about, we have what we call the central obesity. Okay, so increase in body weight has been found to, to or leads to obesity and it's closely associated with diabetes in a condition that is termed diabetes. Okay, so we have there's a new term that has, that is is going on now. We call diabetes, and so if you are you have central obesity, you are likely to end up having diabetes on your hands. And then overweight as well, physical inactivity as was mentioned, and then poor diet or unhealthy diet that is dietary factors, and then for hypertension and dyslipidemia. So all these are factors that you and I can do something about so as to. Even if we are prone to getting the condition, we can delay its onset. Then quickly, we take a look at the class, the, uh, the, the medical diagnosis, and then the classic symptoms okay, of uh, diabetes. So we're saying that, yes, insulin resistance and insulin insufficiency results in hyperglycemia, that is high blood sugar level. And these and therefore it impairs glucose use, which results in hyperglycemia and the most, and the, and the host of uh, symptoms that is characteristic of diabetes. That is to say, the patients who have so much sugar in the system that the system will want to bring out the sugar, but the sugar doesn't come out on its own. And so there is the need to urinate often. So the, the patient visits the washroom very often just to urinate. And then we realize that the urine contains a lot of sugar. Whilst they are urinating, they, may, they will be losing a lot of water. And so there is increased test. And that is what we are calling polydipsia. That's also associated with uh, diabetes. And then some definitions of diabetes has it that in the midst of plenty, you are still hungry. It means that yes, you may have a lot of sugar which in a sense can turn into fuel in your cells. But because the sugars are rather plenty in the blood and not being transported uh, efficiently into your cell, you are, you are starving yourself. So there's constant hunger, okay? And with that, the, 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 the sufferers of this condition tend to lose weight rapidly, okay? Within two weeks, they may lose significant amount of their initial weight. Then again, it affects the nerves, and so it can affect the nerves around the eyes, and there's what we call vision changes. So there's blurred vision for them. They easily get tired, 
And so fatigue is another of their classic symptoms. There are other symptoms which I am sure um, as we manage our cases on day by day basis, we have heard of. So there could be numbness or tingling sensations. There could be what? Urinary tract infection, okay? And, and, and so on and so forth. For the di medical diagnosis, this comes about when the patient reports of uh, frequently one of four of these symptoms, as I have mentioned, plus a blood glucose as a, a, a value that is fasting plasma glucose value of more than or equal to seven millimol per liters. Again, for the pregnant woman, we use the oral glucose tolerance test, a value of more than or beyond 11.1 millimol per liter plus the signs and symptoms of diabetes, then the patient will be diagnosed as having what, uh, uh, diabetes. Again, we can use what we call the HbA1c, which is glycated hemoglobin. Okay, so we have uh, uh, sugars getting attached to the red blood cells circulating in the, in, 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 circulating in the system. And so if a figure of 6.5% has been found consistently, and this uh, medical diagnosis comes about not on just one occasion, but then we, and the, the doctors will call for the lab test to be done uh, uh, on two or three occasions, plus the signs and symptoms, and then they diagnose the patient as having what the diabetes condition. Okay. So we move on to medical nutrition therapy. What is medical nutrition therapy? And according to the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, um, nutrition, it's a nutrition-based treatment that is provided by a registered dietitian or nutritionist. And this comprises of the nutrition assessment, nutrition diagnosis, and then a therapeutic and professional counseling services with the aim of what? Helping to manage the diabetes conditions. So you end, you end up bringing down the blood sugar level of your clients. And so it is the cornerstone of type 2 diabetes management. In fact, it's also a cornerstone for managing type 1 diabetes as well as um, gestational diabetes. And MNT has also been shown to be effective in managing not just hyperglycemia, but also hypertension and hyperlipidemia, which often accompany the type 2 diabetes, especially. Okay. So... I want us to go through a bit of the ADIME, which means the nutrition assessment, nutrition diagnosis, nutrition intervention, and then we end up with the monitoring and then evaluation. Yes, these are what we are, we, 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 we are, we are, we, we are fond of using in our facilities. And so this will be more or less a refresher for us. For those who, are, who, who, do, who do not know, this will be a new thing for them to learn as well. So yes. Detailed assessment is very, very important to provide an individualized nutrition care plan. And so it starts with us going through the ABCDs when it comes to the nutrition, when it comes to the anthropometric measurements. And so we need to take accurate height measurements of our clients, same as accurate weight for the clients. You could also, for want of a better word, if you don't know the weight of your patient, then you could ask of, 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 of you, can, you could ask them about their usual body weight and that could give you an idea. And then you calculate your body mass index using the uh, measured height and then weight to just oppose it with the WHO BMI reference points. Okay. Then we'll move on to the biochemical data. Yes, with uncontrolled diabetes, as I said earlier, it can bring on hypertension, it can bring on uh, kidney diseases. So we want to find out okay, from the patients, their labs, whether they have issues with their kidney function. So there's a need to also uh, go in for a kidney function test because uncontrolled diabetes, that is a hyperglycemia, can destroy the, the glomerulus and that can affect the functioning of the kidney. Then again, we are interested in looking out for their lipid profile, uh, test the results. So you want to look out for their total cholesterol, their, the level of LDL, HDL, 
triglycerides, and then their risk for getting heart, heart diseases. And then obviously, you'll be interested in the fasting plasma glucose or fasting blood sugar, and then the oral glucose tolerance test and glycated hemoglobin. So these are key assessment tools that we need to get from our patients, okay? Then when it comes to the clinical assessments, we can add the client history to that as well, okay? So here we'll be interested in the, the blood pressure reading because as we saw earlier in, as, uh, in the risk factors for especially type two diabetes, uh, uncontrolled blood pressure or uncontrolled hypertension, high blood pressure, is one key risk factor for getting diabetes. So you want to know from your clients their, their level of blood pressure. So you need to check that or assess that. Then there are previous medical conditions, if any, and then medications that they are on. And this helps us especially to know which food groups may be interacting with the medications that they are on and how to maneuver our way around that. Again, some of them may not be taking prescribed medications. So we need to know whether they are take, getting from over the counter and how we, uh, the kind of advice we can give to them as well. Socioeconomic status is very, it's also very key for us to know. So we want to find out whether they have the financial muscle to be able to implement the nutrition care plan that will be given to them. So it's very important to know their financial status. You can, do, you, you can use their occupation if, if, if you read through their uh, folders or their limbs. Then again, the food security, can they get access to food and also are they eating, or do they have enough food in their, their household that they can follow to be able to have, have good nutrition status? Their support system, who and who does the shopping for them? Okay, ingredient shopping, who and who does the cooking for them? And who is their backbone, who supports them? Okay, when they are ill and when they can't do uh, uh, much of the cooking by themselves. So we need to know all of these, okay? Then when it comes to the diet history, that's the food and nutrition related history, uh, it is very, very important for us to look or to ask and check for uh, um, certain things. For example, they are eating pattern, okay? So we'll do a 24 hour report within the past 24 hours, what foods and drinks have they uh, taken in, okay? And usually, just doing a one 24 hour record will not give you a fair idea about them. their food choice. So it is it now the, the evidence is that it is best to do at least two uh, 24 hour record, one weekday and then one weekend, or one work, working day and then one uh, off work day. This is very, very important so that it gives you a fair idea as to how your clients are eating. Then again, the food frequency. Yes, certain foods that they frequently eat, you will need to look at that. And then their timing of their food intake, very, very important as well for us to take note of. Then what food allergies there may be or not, food preferences that they like, their intolerances as well, their favorite foods, their dislikes, okay? And then whether by their own evolution, they have restricted the intake of certain foods, okay? And then again, we want to look at their uh, ethnic, cultural, and religious influence. So, so, for example, we know that certain religious groups will not eat certain kinds of food. So we must be able to elicit this as well from our patients. Okay. So it is very, very important to do a thorough nutrition assessment because this will help us to individualize the nutrition care plan for our patients. And so we want to take a look at now after your thorough nutrition assessment, you have found a particular problem, nutrition problem that you as a dietitian or a nutritionist will be able to, 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 to manage. And so we have what a few of the nutrition problems here and the reasons why we can choose one or two of them, okay? So this list is not exhaustive. So we have ex excessive energy intake or excessive carbohydrate intake and these, can, can be a nutrition problem, especially for someone who has elevated fasting blood sugar, okay? Or who has um, um, elevated um, random blood sugar. This is indicated, and this is indicative of the fact that the patient is either taking in too much energy giving foods or is taking in excess of carbohydrates. So based on your thorough 
um, 24 hour dietary recall, you may be able to calculate the amount of carbohydrates in their diet and whether it is exceeded what they are supposed to take per day. And that will help you to come up with this uh, nutrition problem. Two, excessive protein or fat intake. Yes, excess fat or protein, excess protein or fat in meals also can affect glycemia. And so this is because in a meal, it, it can affect blood glucose level by delaying or but yes, by delaying carbohydrate absorption and or altering the insulin response, okay? So you can either cause insulin resistance because you have so much fat, then the cell receptors are not, will not be able to what, um, uh, will not be able to respond to the, 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 ins the insulin as it brings glucose to it. Then inconsistent carbohydrate intake. Yes. Insulin or insulin to beta drugs demand regular and predictable of carbohydrates. So therefore, if you have a client who skips a lot of their meals or have low carbohydrate intake, then this um, problem will be best fit such a, a case. Okay. Then you have physical inactivity. Usually diabetics are overweight or obese. They have they, they have certain barriers when it comes to doing physical activity. So what we need to do is that yes, um, obesity can impair their physical activity. So arthritis is another thing that can also impair them uh, physically and uh, engaging in exercise. So found out that yes, through your assessment, your 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 clients suffer from any of these conditions. Physical activity, inactivity. Food, Okay. So I have a, a couple of uh, pair statements here. So we have a problem being excessive energy intake. Okay, Hello. Had me. Maybe you can mute everyone. Okay. Now it is better. So yes, we have excessive energy intake related to frequent consumption of large portions of food as evidenced by self-reported food intake and a three kilogram weight gain over two months. Or you can have inconsistent carbohydrate intake relating it to food and nutrition related knowledge deficits concerning appropriate meal timing as evidenced by three episodes of hypoglycemia in the past week. And then last but not the least, self-monitoring deficit related to significant time constraints due to work schedules, as evidenced by blood glucose log revealing just five readings for the past month instead of the recommended 30 readings. So this pair statement helps us to be able to resolve the etiology and then eventually what? Help manage the nutrition problem. So that is when you do a thorough nutrition assessment, it helps you to identify a particular problem and then to find a cause to the problem that you can intervene as a dietitian or a nutritionist. Now, to the meat of our presentation, we want to look at nutrition intervention and recommendations for nutritional management of diabetes take into account two factors. One, the nutrition, that the nutrition therapy must be evidence-based, okay? And then two, that the nutrition prescription you give out should be individualized. And you must also collaborate with your patient as well. So it is a patient-centered kind of care that we are giving, okay? And that is how come there's no one-size-fits-all uh, nutrition therapy for managing diabetes, okay? Yes, so additionally, in the nutrition intervention, you are expected to set some goals that will help, some goals to improve eating patterns or food choices based on the individual's preferences. So I want us to take a look at goals, okay? So diabetes is not, is, is managed, but it does not go away because it's a chronic condition. It's a progressive condition at that too. So whether we consider type one, or type two diabetes, the goal of effective diabetes management is always to control the blood glucose levels by keeping them within a target range, okay? That is individually determined for each client. Okay? So some clients are able to well uh, 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 control their sugars so tightly that 
Well, when you give them your, your nutrition care plan, they'll be able to follow through. Others, it takes a bit of a time. So it is always individualized. However, according to the um, um, American Diabetes Association, these are the recommended targets. For glycated hemoglobin, that is HbA1c, you are looking at a sugar level below 7%, okay? And then for pre-meal plasma glucose, that is the fasting um, blood sugar, we are looking at a sugar level of between four to seven millimole per liters. And then when it is peak at the, at the, at the peak uh, period where you have the postprandial plasma glucose, that is to say the random uh, um, um, blood sugar, you are looking at a value of less than 10 when zero millimole per liter. So these are the targets that we can also work around with our clients on an individual basis, okay? Just to help them maintain their sugar uh, level. So there are four nutritional goals, four broad or general nutritional goals. And out of that, we can also set smaller goals with our clients just to be able to help them manage their sugar level. So I want us to take brief, uh, briefly look at uh, the four main goals, general goals. So one, we are saying that yes, um, the objective of nutrition therapy is to help people with diabetes learn how to make appropriate lifestyle choices. Okay, once that is made, this can help these people with diabetes achieve an optimum metabolic control and prevent diabetes complications. So one of the, or the first goal is that I want to promote and support healthy eating patterns, specifically for our patients to be able to what? Either delay or prevent diabetes complications, either achieve and maintain body weight goals, or attain an individualized glycemic blood pressure and lipid goals. So the goals you set for them, you want them to achieve this one through, uh, by promoting and supporting healthy eating patterns for them. So, as we go along, we take a look at the healthy eating patterns that research has shown can help uh, uh, diabetes manage their um, um, condition. Two, the second goal here talks mainly about us individualizing the nutrition care plan. Okay, so for instance, there is no need going ahead to teach carbohydrate counting to a client who has challenges with literacy and numeracy. Somebody who finds it difficult, who has challenges with mathematics or has challenges with even reading, it will be very difficult for you to, to, to educate such a patient on carbohydrate counting. But then you can educate such a patient on portion size control. So it is very key for us to what? Engage our clients based on their knowledge level on what and what they can do. So you individualize the care plan for them. Okay, access to health, healthy food choices. You can, you can educate somebody who doesn't uh, have the mathematics at hand or is uh, found, uh, fumbles when it comes to uh, literacy. You can just educate them on healthy food choices around their community that they can go in for, okay? And, and so on and so forth. So that is goal number two. Now for goal number three, yes, it says that we need to maintain the pleasure of eating by providing positive messages about food choices while limiting food choices based on scientific evidence. So we can only limit our clients from taking in certain foods when there are grounds for it, when the science backs it. So when you have evidence saying that, yes, you should avoid so-and-so type of food, but then we should continue to what? Let them enjoy the food that they are eating. So the fact that a diabetic patient has hypertension doesn't mean they should stop all forms of salt intake. No, otherwise, how would they enjoy the food that they are supposed to enjoy or they are supposed to eat? So maintain the pleasure of eating. Diabetes, yes, some will come to your, 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 your consulting room and say they want to uh, use, continue to use sugar. Yes, you can, you can allow that. That's why there's food exchange list. And then you'll be able to what, adjust the amount of sugar that they can use in their, in their meals. So then again, you are still maintaining the pleasure of eating, okay, for them. Then the last point is that you provide practical tools for day-to-day -to -day meal planning to the diabetic. So here we are saying that, yes, um, we need to educate or empower our clients 
to be able to self-manage their condition as well. So after your counseling, you must be able to educate them and give them or offer them educational tools. So on your screens, you can see that there is the what? The plate model. That is the one, the, 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 the picker below on your left. There's a plate model. And that plate model um, recommends that, that what one fourth of the food they take should come from starch. Uh, so you divide the plate into two. You can see that half of the plate is full of vegetables and then fruits, more or less. Then the remaining half has been divided into uh, another half again. So we have a quarter. So a quarter of the food should come from protein and a quarter should come from starch or cereal. So that is the plate model. But then in Ghana here, we have the healthy eating food steps, which looks more like steps that you are climbing with the base having the cereals, the fruits and vegetables. And then as you climb up the proteins, a small amount of that. And then the least will be the fats and oils. Recently, the country also launched the Ghana food-based dietary guidelines. That is uh, around uh, 22nd February. And this recommends that we eat a diverse and varied diet from the six food groups every day. So we have about six food groups, meaning fruits, vegetables, legumes and nuts, animal source foods, healthy fats and oils, and then whole or unpolished grains, cereals and tubers. So this is what nutritionists and dietitians have come together to come out with, and together with the Food and Agriculture, the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, that we have launched the Ghana Food-Based Dietary Guidelines. And, and, and I expect all of us to at least familiarize ourselves with that so that we can help our, uh, our diabetics manage or have a proper food choice on their hands that they will be able to eat to maintain a good uh, a glycemic value. And then there's also the Eat Well Plate model, and that is with the UK and the United Kingdom. So there are a number of guidelines that has, uh, that has come out, and it is country specific. And says the Australians have theirs, the US also have theirs and what have you. But we have our Ghana food-based dietary guidelines that we can fall on, okay? Now, let's take a look at the MNT recommendations for diabetes management. And so when it comes to the nutrition prescription, usually we fall on one or two of these that we'll, we'll be talking about. So we have the carbohydrate controlled diet or carbohydrate modified diet. Okay, so the diet for people with diabetes, I must say it is no different from that considered healthy for everyone. And there are a variety of approaches that work for diabetes management. And that is why the diet is individualized, as I said earlier, based on the patient's current eating patterns, their personal preferences, their cultural practices, and socioeconomic status. So the carbohydrate-controlled diet is a diet that focuses on controlling the servings of carbohydrate foods, because we all know that carbohydrate is the main uh, nutrient that impacts directly on the sugar level within the blood. And so if you are able to control that, then one way or the other, we're able to bring down or manage their blood sugar levels for them. And for most people, the carbohydrates, the percentage carbohydrate contribution to total energy intake is around 45 to 65%. That is the acceptable micronutrient distribution range that a whole lot of bodies have come out to I have, I have, I have um, agreed to. So that is 45 to 65% of total caloric intake should come from the carbohydrates. Then you have what we call the fiber modified diet as well. Again, in our prescriptions, we say that our diabetics should be able to increase their fiber intake. Yes, research has shown that there's a modest reduction in glycated hemoglobin. Uh, that has been observed when their fiber intake exceeds 50 grams per day. But then again, the research also, or the, the, yes, the evidence is also that the fiber recommendations for the general population does not differ when it comes to diabetics as well. So generally, yes, they are supposed to have 
increased intake of fiber, but then it is supposed to be within the what the general population also takes. Okay. Now, regular intake of sufficient fiber that is within the grammage of about 20, the grammage of about 25 to 30 gram per day results in lower mortality in type 2 DM patients. And we all know the benefits that fiber confers to the system. So soluble fibers help slow down the absorption of glucose and reduces the absorption of dietary fats as well. Okay, And insoluble fiber uh, provides bulk to food and therefore high fiber foods generally have fewer calories. And that helps our clients also to manage their sugar level as well. Then we have the specific eating patterns. Okay, so a number of research has gone on and there is no singular eating pattern that is more effective than others with respect to weight loss, with respect to weight maintenance or glycemic management in patients with diabetes. Okay, the Mediterranean diet or the Mediterranean style eating plan is a dietary pattern that emphasizes on what? Lots of whole grains, fruits, vegetables, legumes, nuts, moderate amount of fish, and then olive oil. It, however, limits the intake of refined carbohydrates, saturated and trans fats, as well as it favors rather the high fiber foods with antioxidants. So with this plan, research has found out that patients are able to have a reduced glycated hemoglobin. So it reduces the HbA1c level. It reduces triglycerides and eventually also what reduces their risk of getting cardiovascular diseases. So as you can see, the insulin sensitivity is increased when you are on this uh, uh, eating plan or you are on this eating pattern. So it is advised or it is recommended for us as dietitians and nutritionists to as much as possible when we are planning the nutrition care for our patients with diabetes to look at using this type of um, eating pattern, the Mediterranean style eating pattern. So here, yes, there is a slight difference between this and then the DASH diet, but as we go along, we get to see the difference. So the next eating pattern that I want to discuss here is the dietary approaches to stop hypertension. And let's bear in mind that hypertension, as we saw earlier, is a key risk factor for uh, uh, getting diabetes. And so it can worsen uh, diabetic patients, their conditions as well. So there's a need for us to help them manage their, uh, 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 or to help them manage hypertension if they have it, or to help them manage their salt intake if they don't have hypertension. So yes, this uh, research has found out that yes, the DASH style of eating results in weight loss it lowers the blood pressure as well as lowers the low density lipoprotein cholesterol. But however, it does not significantly lead to a reduction uh, in, the, uh, in their sugar level. Yes, so this eating style approaches that what the patients go on a lot of the fruits and vegetables, um, a lot of the whole grains, and then reduces the in, their intake of saturated fats as well as the trans fats and, uh, and, and um, the bad fats as well. But then it's what preaches that will limit the intake of sodium or salt for that matter. Okay. So that is very, very important. As well as it also preaches that there should be no alcohol intake. So that is the difference between the DASH style eating pattern as against the Mediterranean style eating pattern. I take it again. So the DASH diet preaches that, well, you are supposed to have an increase in the intake of whole unpolished grains and cereals. You are supposed to have an increased intake when it comes to fruits and vegetables, but then you limit your intake of what? Saturated fats or unhealthy fats and then trans fats. Aside that, it also limits the intake of salt or sodium for that matter, as well as it doesn't recommend any intake of alcohol at all. 
And I'm saying that the difference with this and the Mediterranean diet is that Mediterranean diet admonishes that you can have a glass of wine at the table. So it, 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 it more or less limits the intake of alcohol, but there's alcohol in there. And also, it also uh, um, uh, speaks to um, uh, um, using what? Limiting, limiting salt. There's no limitation of salt when it comes to the Mediterranean diet style. But then with the DASH diet, it limits the intake of salt. And so what we have here, you can see that at the center of the diagram, the center of the picture, there is a heart that is there. So that is a heart healthy eating pattern or heart healthy eating uh, uh, diet plan that we can advocate for our uh, diabetics. Okay. So not long ago, just April 29th, 2023, the American Heart Association came out with a ranking of the eating patterns that we have seen, the Mediterranean uh, style and then the DASH style eating pattern, as well as the plant-based one, that's the vegetarian diet, the vegetarian or the vegan diet. And they ranked these three and said that the DASH diet is the best, is the number one when it comes to um, helping, uh, uh, um, especially hypertensives, to manage their, their, um, uh, um, their salt intake or their, their condition. So that is number one for that matter. And then it placed the Mediterranean style as number three. But in between that and then the DASH diet, was the, what they call the pescatarian. That's a form of uh, vegetarianism where they, 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 they allow the intake of um, seafoods, uh, but they don't eat any other animal foods. So these three were ranked as the best uh, uh, diet for the heart. And I am pretty much sure that if we want to help our clients who are diabetic not to catch hypertension, then these are the three main uh, eating patterns that we can advocate for them so that we might, they, will, it, they, they will be able to manage their sugar condition and not get other complications as well. So the last or the specific, uh, that, and, the, and the third specific eating pattern has to do with the vegetarian diet or the vegan eating pattern. And research has also shown that this style of eating helps to reduce the glycated hemoglobin as well, as well as reduce their body weight and also the low density lipoprotein. So these diets are very rich when it comes to unpolished or whole grains. And they are also very rich in fruits and vegetables. And these foods have lower amount of calories in them. And so it helps our clients to lose the bit of weight we want them to lose. And more so, if you are able to add energy restricted diet to these um, specified diets, you are then in a, in, a, in a way going to help your clients uh, what, uh, reduce their sugar level drastically. So let's talk a bit about glycemic index as well. That's another specific eating uh, pattern. Yes, there is so much um, um, uncertainty or uh, um, um, there, there's no consensus when it comes to the glycemic index or load because it measures how much a food affects blood glucose level. So there's no clear impact of that uh, style when it comes to HbA1c. Okay, research hasn't shown that. Rather, there's what we call mixed results on its impact on the fasting blood sugar. And so we're saying that Yes, we, the practical advice here is that you can allow your patients to have at least one low glycemic index food at each meal. And then if they are interested in taking high glycemic index food, then they must go a long way to what? Add a low glycemic index food to it. So a mixture of that is better, okay, than just taking the high glycemic index food alone. And then you can also substitute a high glycemic index cereals, breads, rice with the low glycemic index uh, ones as well. And these are some of the things that we can uh, help our clients with so that they'll be able to manage their sugars very well. Then we have the carbohydrate counting. Okay, 
So with carbohydrate counting, we are saying that it's with a meal planning approach that involves estimating the amount of carbohydrates in each meal and matching it with insulin or other medications. So generally, this uh, uh, eating pattern helps us manage our type 1 diabetes, diabetics very well, okay? as well as those type 2 diabetics who are on insulin. Okay, so this improves their glycemic control. We all know that, yes, with, carb, with carbohydrate counting, it may be exhausting for most people. So this will be good for those who are, 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 are um, what do you call it, knowledgeable, those who have uh, uh, literacy and numeracy at, at their hands that they can comprehend when you are teaching them how to go around that. So yes, several studies have shown that Carbohydrate counting can improve glycemic control in people with type 1 and type 2 diabetes. We know that a serving of a carbohydrate is 15 grams, and 15 grams is equivalent to one insulin unit. So once you know the total amount of insulin units that the doctor has given to a diabetic patient, you'll be able to know the servings of carbohydrates that will match that amount of um, insulin. So the education can go on for those who have numeracy and literacy at hand that they can work with. Then the timing of meals. Yes, this is very, very key because yes, reduct, there is a reduction of HbA1c as one eats consistent amount of carbohydrate at consistent meal times. It helps because it helps the patient be able to uh, um, um, remove the extra glucose that has come in at a certain period of time so that they don't end up what overwhelming the system with so much sugar when they eat in a haphazard manner, when they eat without much, without any, without taking time into consideration. So it's very, very important that in our care for diabetics, we look at the timing of their meals as well. And that is very crucial. Now, what about drinks, salt, spices, and then tobacco? So yes, um, reduce sugar sweetened beverages. Research, research has shown that high intakes of sugar sweetened beverages are associated with the development of obesity, which as we all know, is also a risk factor for type two diabetes and uh, other cardiovascular diseases as well. And so sugary drinks and alcoholic beverages must be restricted. Now, patients, we can encourage our patients to rather drink water in place of the sugar sweetened beverages and the artificially sweetened beverages. Okay, so the artificially sweetened beverages have what we call low calorie sweetness in them instead of the, the uh, caloric sweetness. So there are a number of them that, are, that, are, that have been approved, but then it is important that their intake it falls within the acceptable daily intake so that it will not have any impact on the glycemic control of the patient. That is what research has come out with. For alcohol, yes, diabetics are to follow the general recommendation for alcoholic intake for the population as well. So two or less standard drinks of alcohol a day is advised. However, we must advise them that they should take these um, alcoholic beverages with food in their stomach. Because we know that taking in alcoholic beverages with no food can lead to hypoglycemia, which is an acute complication of the condition for them. So the standard drink is defined as one, 12 ounces of beer, as about three and 45 meals, about five ounces of table wine, um, that is wine that is not fortified, and that's about 142 meals, and then, Spirits, that's, that's has to do with the brandy, the whiskey, the distilled, I mean, I mean alcoholic beverages. So we have about 1.5 ounces, making about 43 meals. And then fortified wine, wine that has distilled uh, um, and distilled or spirits added to it. So you have about three ounces of that. And that is the recommendation from the experts. Again, when it comes to the salt uh, control or salt intake, it is advised that what um, we moderate that for the diabetic. Yes, most, most guidelines recommend a reduction of salt 
to about five to six grams per day and effectively reducing consumption by a third. And so for the diabetic especially, it is recommended that they lower their intake of salt or sodium for that matter, okay? Now, lower levels are recommended for all, especially for people with diabetes. And as hypertension is the recognized risk factor for diabetic nephropathy and cardiovascular disease, sodium control and restriction is very much so important for people with diabetes. And so most sodium we know comes from processed or preserved or baked or restaurant foods. Okay, so it is important that we, in our, in our dietary history, we find out from our clients uh, whether they frequently eat out and from which restaurants in particular, or whether they frequently buy convenient foods on the roadside and what have you. And this way, or whether they take in a lot of processed or pre-packaged foods, and this way we'll be able to help them to, uh, or be able to advise them to minimize the intake of these foods, but they are living with so much salt. Okay, so there's again the need for the use of natural spices vis-a-vis -vis the artificial ones. Yes, the artificial ones tend to also have a bit of monosodium in them that can also worsen their hypertensive conditions if care is not taken or if it is taken for a longer period of time and in, in higher doses. Okay, so it's very important that we advise our clients to go in for the natural spices which are around us, okay? So again, the last point here is that smoking or tobacco use must be stopped, okay? Because this is the single most powerful lifestyle measure for preventing the complications associated with hypertension. And this is a WHO guideline, which we must try as much as possible to advise or educate our clients to stop smoking, okay? Because smoking can lead to having insulin insensitivity when it comes to that. Now, what about the MNT guidelines for gestational diabetes? So there should be a patient-centered healthy diet with caloric goals designed with both the fetal and maternal outcomes in mind. So when you are planning a nutrition uh, 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 or you are giving a nutrition prescription to a, a GDM, you must have in mind Fetal growth and then the, the, the mother's health as well. Now, for GDM, a minimum of about 175 grams of carbohydrates is what is recommended, okay, what the experts recommend to be given. And then a minimum of about 71 gram protein is also recommended. The dietary fiber intake is about 28 grams of, and all of these will go along with help manage the GDM patients and help them control their sugars well. Again, there's a need to individualize their carbohydrates in with emphasis on rich, low glycemic uh, carbohydrates with special attention focused on their breakfast meals. Because breakfast as well is the most important meal for the day. And these patients will need, need, need breakfast to help you do your activities for the rest of the day. So it's very important that we advise our patients not to skip breakfast or breakfast at all. Now, individualized consisting of more and snacks. Can we can we meet? Um, all right, let's continue. So we are, again, the guideline says that what we should encourage our GDM patients to at least partake in 30 minutes of moderate physical activity on most days of the week. And this advice also goes generally to the type one and type two diabetics as well. So yes, I, 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 it escaped me, but then it is uh, Sankofa is something that is good. So there are three prone approaches to managing the diabetes. And we are interested in the medical nutrition therapy aspect. So that's why I didn't mention much about the exercise bit. But then exercise, the medical nutrition therapy, and then the medication or pharmacotherapy are three prone things or items that are used in managing diabetes. So it's, it's important when it comes to the medical nutrition therapy that 
we spread the meals of the, the GDM patients to three main meals, uh, plus or minus two snacks per day for them. Okay, so that is very, very crucial to help them go through the day successfully. So this is a summary of the recommended composition of diets for people with diabetes, how we can help treat them. This is just a summary. Okay, so we're saying that, yes, for the carbohydrates, the percentage contribution to energy should be between 45 to 65%. Okay, and if the patient demands or requests that they need to take sugar, then their sugar intake should form less than 10% of their total energy or their total calories for the day. Then when it comes to protein, it is important that we look at between 10 to 20% of their total energy coming from protein. Okay, now for those diabetes who may have complications when it comes to kidney problems, that is where we can adjust this percentage for them, especially if they are not on dialysis. Then again, the percentage contribution of protein can go to about 10% or less, okay, because they are not on dialysis. But those who are on dialysis, they may end up catching up with a 20% or even more. Then for fat, percentage contribution of fat to total energy should be between 25 to 30%. Okay, and it, we, are, we, are, we are reminded to encourage our clients to go in for lower fat dairy products and also to reduce their intake of saturated fat to less than 7% of total energy intake. Okay, usually this figure is for those diabetics who have complications such as dyslipidemia. Then you give them a saturated fat of less than 7%. But those without um, um, dyslipidemia, they can have about less than 10% of their total energy coming from saturated fat. Again, for cholesterol, those with complications, okay, other comorbidities, they will need a cholesterol intake of less than 200 milligram per day. And I am sure by now we know that one world egg can match up to that, can give us roughly around the 200 milligram per day. But then for those with no comorbidities attached to their diabetes, the recommendation is that they can have cholesterol intake of about less than 300 milligram per day. Now, micronutrients, so fruits and vegetables are recommended to be in the region of five servings per day. And so these are a summary of the recommendations that the experts have come out with in helping our diabetics manage their sugar level. Now for monitoring and evaluation, for the first six months, okay, uh, of medical nutrition therapy, we need to schedule at least three to at most six follow-up encounters with our clients. Okay, and this is because ongoing medical nutrition therapy can maintain or improve reductions in the glycated hemoglobin for more than 12 months. Okay, and this is an expert's opinion on that. Now, A1C, we should reassess that uh, um, lab value twice in a year in individuals with generally stable glycemic control. So two times in a year. So that would mean that every six months, they can go in for this test to reassess whether they are meeting the targets that we have uh, together with them uh, said we are going to achieve. Then for those who are not meeting their glycemic goals, we are supposed to uh, um, uh, reassess their glycated hemoglobin value every quarterly. So that means every three months, you can ask them to go and test for the HbA1c to see whether they are making headway in terms of glycemic control. Then for results of pre and postprandial glucose measurements should be discussed. So yes, after getting the results, you need to discuss the results and explain things to the client's understanding so that then the next follow-up, they be able to implement the nutrition care that you have given them so that it will manifest in their blood sugar levels at the next visit. Now, the common coexistence of hyperlipidemia and hypertension in people with diabetes also will require monitoring of metabolic parameters such as the fasting lipid profile. 
So it is not far-fetched to also request your client to go in for a lipid profile test. So that then this should normally be performed annually for uh, annually or even more often if needed to evaluate the effectiveness of the nutrition uh, strategy or nutrition care plan you have given. And if there's a need to adjust same, okay? So that is very, very important. The fasting lipid profile that can be performed uh, annually. Again, for blood pressure, it should be measured at every routine diabetes visit. So every time they come for the review, you need to check their blood pressure level. And then if there's a need to reinforce the education on uh, lowering their intake of sodium or salt, salty foods, then you do that again for them. Then kidney function tests. So like I said earlier, yes, uncontrolled diabetes can go as a long, uh, can go a long way to uh, um, um, affect the glomerulus and the filtering components of, 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 of the system or of the kidneys. And that can then cause kidney problems. So there's a need for us to annually assess their kidney functions. So how well are their kidneys functioning? So that will also tell us how well they are managing their sugars as well. So this can be done annually for diabetes. Then for weight status or weight changes, we need to evaluate if weight loss goals are met at every routine diabetes visit. So every time they visit your facility, you need to well check their weight and then you evaluate. Okay, you just oppose that with their previous weight, whether they gained or lost. And if they are barriers to their weight loss strategy, you need to educate the same for them. Then dietary adherence and tolerance, yes. So evaluate feelings of satiety and hunger. And if there's a need for you to adjust their energy intake. So we need to evaluate every time they visit your consulting room, you need to evaluate yes, how much, whether, whether they are feeling satisfied with the food that you have given them or with the nutrition prescriptions in terms of the energy, the calories that you have given them or not. And then you can do adjustments to that as well. Then physical activity. It is very important that we evaluate the minutes of physical activity that they have done per week. So as we saw earlier for the guidelines on the GDM, yes, 30 minutes on most days of the week. That could be about three to five days of the week. So ideally, they are supposed to meet 150 minutes per week of physical exercise. And we need to evaluate that. So we ask them within the week, how many minutes have they been, how many minutes of exercise have they been able to do? So in conclusion, let me say that detailed assessment, okay, is the foundation of future intervention when it comes to managing diabetes. Once you do a detailed nutrition assessment of your clients, it helps you to individualize the care plan for the, di for the diabetic in front of you. So there is no one size fit all when it comes to managing diabetes. Now, medical nutrition therapy is the cornerstone for the prevention and management of diabetes. And this is very, very crucial. So whether it is a type one diabetes or type two diabetes or even gestational diabetes, you will we need to implement the medical nutrition therapy as we have seen today, using the ADIME, the nutrition assessment, nutrition uh, diagnosis, intervention, and then monitoring and evaluation. And because research has shown that this helps our clients to be able to uh, control their sugars very well. Now, dietitians and nutritionists must therefore be up to speed with current evidence-based nutrition strategies that we can use in the care of our clients. So today, if you haven't learned anything at all, your take-home message will be that, yes, there are different eating or there are different specific eating uh, patterns that we can use to help our clients who are diabetics control their sugar level. So we can use what we call the Mediterranean style eating plan. We can use the DASH style eating plan. And we can use also the vegetarian or the vegan or the plant-based eating plan. And all of these go a long way to help manage their sugar level. It goes a long way to help manage their uh, 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 lipid level or their cholesterol or their fat levels, as well as helps them to uh, lose a bit of weight, if that is the goal for you. So 
I want to thank you all for listening to me this evening. I will stop here and uh, wait for uh, inputs, be it comments or questions. So over to the console. Okay, thank you very much, Adi Jonathan. We are very grateful for this in-depth nutrition strategies you've given to us, and they are evidence-based too. Thank you very much. And so now we'll move to our question and answer session. But before that, we have the attendance link in the chat box. So kindly fill the link. And so please, if you have any questions, kindly raise your hand. So you use the icon. And before that, someone is the question in the chat box. Is that how much grams of carbohydrates is required for each unit of insulin? Could you kindly give some examples of servings that meet this quantity of carbohydrates? All right, can I go ahead? Yes, please. Okay, yes, yeah, so on the slide, I, I, I made mention of the fact that for every 15 gram of uh, uh, carbohydrates, it is matched with one insulin unit. And we are also very much aware that a serving of a carbohydrate is 15 grams. So an example for a serving of a carbohydrate given as 15 grams will be three cubes of sugar, okay, or three teaspoons of sugar. And that is a serving of uh, sugar, giving us 15 grams. And then that could be matched with what? One insulin unit, one insulin shot. And that will take care of the sugar that has entered into the patient's blood. So that is that. If you are talking about um, fruits, for example, uh, one medium serving or one medium size of banana is a serving of a carbohydrate. So that will also go a long way to also match with one insulin unit. Okay, so that those are examples when it comes to seven sizes. Thank you. Hello, Evelyn. Okay, hello, please, I'm here. I'm sorry, my network. Um, oh. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so Mr. Pabna Okran, your hand is raised. Please kindly unmute and let us get your question. Thank you. Hello. I saw Mr. Okran's hand up, so please. Okay, since Mr. Okran is not ready to talk, we'll move to the next question, which is in the chat box. Um, it's a very insightful presentation, boss. Please, can coconut water be a recommendation to quench thirst in diabetics? All right, thank you very much for that question. Yes, coconut water, it is good and it's a fruit. But then you see with diabetes, we are talking about the control, calorie control. So in, in as much as it is good, portion sizes, is very, very critical for them. And so the fact that you can go in for one coconut doesn't mean that you can abuse that and overindulge in the coconut water. Okay, so yes, coconut water is, is okay to quench the test for diabetics, but we shouldn't overdo that. So stick, stick to the portion sizes that have been given to you as a diabetic or that 
you as a nutritionist or dietitian will give to the diabetic patient. So I would say that it is a good question. It is good for diabetics. You can use um, coconut water to quench your test, but you shouldn't, or, but you should be mindful of the amount or the number of coconuts you drink, okay, at a time. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Aldi. Okay, another question in the chat box. It says, um, please, are diabetics allowed to fast? Okay, thank you very much. Yes, so um, when it comes to fasting, um, there is no concrete, uh, should I say, recommendation uh, for, uh, especially with a type 1 diabetes, they are not supposed to fast at all. Uh, because for them, they are constantly injecting insulin to be able to manage their sugar level. And uh, um, American Diabetes Association has also not come out with any guidelines when it comes to fasting for type 2 diabetics as well. So I must say that with fasting, you need to work as a team with a medical officer who is also caring for the, 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 the diabetic patient. And then you'll be able to map out a strategy for the patients to either do a mild form of fasting, which will be, which will be lenient on their sugar control, okay? Or maybe the doctor may say outright no. So it depends on the kind of medications that the doctors will give and the kind of advice the doctors will also come out with that we can allow or not a patient to fast, okay? So I must say that with type one, Fasting is not recommended at all, but with type two, we can always work out uh, with our medical officers and find out with, from them whether it is advised that yes, the client in question can do a fast. And if so, what are, are they going to reduce the oral hypoglycemic agents, the drugs that they, they, they give to them or change the ones that are not too, uh, uh, and that, that are not too drastic in reducing sugar level. And then we also as dietitians fashion out a way in which we can help them manage their glucose in terms of using the diet. So that is what I have to say on the fasting. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Aldi Jonathan. And I hope it has answered the subsequent question where someone asks, how would you cancel a pastor who is diabetic and wants to fast? Okay, so we'll move on. Um, before I continue with the chat questions, I want to call Mr. Samuel. Your hand is raised. Please, you are allowed to unmute to your question. Thank you. Uh, please, I'm at the modification that's the classification uh, the risk factors you have the modification the non-modification or modifiable risk factors another now modifiable you see uh, family history uh, and i always have a problem with that if diabetes initially type 2 is lifestyle. And then if a family or the parent of the child or me, like my parent have it, and then I'm able to control my lifestyle or diet, or maybe we are, we are three children of our parents and we are able to control or modify our diet well, can't we be out of type two diabetes? So I have a problem that we add family history to non-modifiable uh, uh, risk factors. So I want more explanation on that. All right. Yes, thank you for your question. Uh, so when we talk about non-modifiable factors, these are things that you and I cannot do anything about. Okay, so when we say we are putting family history, you know, with the type two diabetes, yes, it is lifestyle, but then you need, it, is, it, it, it involves the genetic component as well. So you need to trigger your genes based on your lifestyle 
to be able to manifest the condition on you. So when you have a parent or a sibling with a condition, you can't change your bloodline. So invariably, it means that you have the genes sitting somewhere that is possible that if your lifestyle is not that uh, um, healthy in a way, you will be able or you will trigger the genes into manifesting the condition earlier than you, you, you are supposed to even get it. So that, that is, that is the, that's the main reason why we put the family history under the non-modifiable factors because you cannot change your bloodline. And once the genes has been transferred onto you, there's a, there a, there, there a likelihood, there's an increased risk of you getting the condition as compared to someone who has no bloodline with that condition. So that is why it is there. I hope that answers it for you. Okay. 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 Thank you very much, Audi Jonathan. So we will move on. Someone asked, please, can diabetic patients eat cocoa? Of course. So, like we said, there is no special food for, there's no special diet for the diabetic. The diabetic diet is your normal healthy eating diet. What is of interest to us is their portion size, the portion size control. How much do they sit to eat? That is of importance to us. So that is why we say that yes, they are liberty to eat, but then you need to control the calories that come into their blood. Or yes, the sugars that come into the blood based on the calorie that they are taking. So you can eat your cocoa yam, you can eat whatever it is, but you need to control the amount that you sit to eat. Because that is eventually, that is what will eventually turn into sugar and, and spike the blood the sugar level up. So yes, they can take um, cocoa yam. Um, okay, thank you very much. And um, please, Adi, someone is requesting for your email. Um, so we'll move on to the question. The next question says that, please, I am not clear with the timing of food. Can you please explain again? Okay. So with the meal timing, it is important that, yes, we don't eat at any time at all, especially with diabetics, okay? Because we want to control the sugars that come into the blood. So the frequency of their meals should be well spaced. That's, that's why the timing comes in. So that then you have your main meal for breakfast. You have your main meal as lunch, but the interval between them should be consistent with the interval between the, 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 the lunch time and then the evening meal time, which is the supper time. So if your meal, your breakfast time is around eight o'clock, and then your afternoon time is around, say, 12 o'clock or 1 o'clock. You have an interval of about four to five hours between your breakfast and your lunch. This same interval should be maintained for your uh, lunch, between your lunch time and your supper time. So your supper time should fall within the hours of 5 to 6 or 6.30 maximum. So that is the uh, meal timing that I'm talking about. The meal timing should be consistent. That way you'll be able to manage the sugars that come in your blood because you will not have an influx of sugars coming that will make it difficult for you to control the sugars when the times are not correct. So that's, the, that, that, that's what I mean by the meal time, the proper meal time, yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Aldi. Okay, moving on to the next question. Um, the person wants to find out after assessing the socioeconomic status and as a dietitian, you realize the client can't afford to follow meal plan. What? Hello. Hello. Evelyn. Hello. Yes, I yes. missed the last bit. Okay, I the last so the bit. person wants to find out. Yes, please. So the person wants to find out that after assessing the socioeconomic status and you realize that the client can't afford to follow the meal plan, what can you do to help? 
Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So in this sense, it means that then you have to look out for the food choices that you have made, whether, I mean, there is a, a what do you call it, an alternative to them, healthier alternative to them that the clients can afford, okay, on that, on, 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 and to, to have them and then eat them. Otherwise, what I will do is that, or what I can advise is that you can look out if you are in a facility where there is a welfare system that is working efficiently. You can then again, I mean, um, 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 assist this client to be able to uh, uh, assess that facility within your 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 hospital or your your healthcare. Uh, 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 yes, within your healthcare facility. So it is important that we can also, one way or the other, help our clients who are financially uh, uh, handicapped in a way. One of these things we can do that if. You have a welfare system in your facility that can assist them. That is cool. Otherwise, then you have to look out for, I mean, looking out for food ingredients that are of they are that are of good quality and they are healthier that they can afford to buy. And then that is what you can. So, for example, if the patient cannot afford apple because apple is expensive then you, can, you might as well tell the patient that they should go in for a fruit that is in season. So not necessarily going in for an apple to take. So if, for example, mangoes are in season now, you can tell the client to go in for mangoes because it will be cheaper when they are in season. So that is an example that you can give. So it, it applies to uh, um, other in food ingredients that you can uh, um, show your clients with. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Aldi. Okay, I think this question you spoke about it, but let me say it again. Could you kindly share your thoughts on intermittent fasting among diabetic? Could this help with glycemic control? Yeah, so we are, we addressed that, and I said with di with the type one diabetics, it is not advised or it is not advisable for them to go on that because they frequently need the insulin or they take in insulin shots to be able to help manage their sugars. So if they are going to have a fasting, intermittent fasting, it may not, it may lead them to get into hypo, okay, which is an emergency situation. But with a type 2 diabetic, yes, it, it, you can, with the help of or with the with consultation or with in consultation with your uh, healthcare with a, um, a doctor in charge of the client. Yes, you can discuss and then they can be able to work something around it. And that can also help the clients to do their intermittent fasting because it is based on religious grounds as well. So thank you. Okay, thank you, RD. Before I continue with the questions from the chat, I will invite Nana. She has her hands raised. Yeah, thank you very much. I just want to add to what R.D. Jonathan just said. Anyway, thanks so much for the nice presentation. So with helping the patient to come up with um, alternative, that's if the person is social, like economically, the person cannot afford. There is this scheme that is it integrated social services where the community health nurses help to identify those that are I mean, vulnerable in terms of affordability. So we can use also that option as well. But in a hospital, they also have the, is it the higher risk vulnerable? So you do arrangements internally with the, your matron through writing of memo. So that one maybe you might have to pre, the hospital might have to pre-finance then, but it, it takes a short while, not like those, I mean, the long uh, process. So at least there's, uh, there's something that we can do to help our patients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very valuable uh, uh, intervention. Thank you very much. So we are continuing with the question. Uh, another question says, uh, please, how is the data pairing with regards to recovery or having clients return to normalcy when it comes to DM management with MNT? Um, Evelyn, come again. How is the data work? 
preparing with regards to recovery. So the person wants to know the data showing recovery rates. Oh, I don't have, and I'm sure that this one will be uh, facility specific. I haven't um, 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 searched to get a data, but I mean, it is, it is, it is well known. I mean, that MNT helps to um, control the sugars of the diabetic patients. But for Ghana, I don't have that data readily available. I'm sure when we look at the, like I said, in the MNT, it is not just, when we are managing the diabetes patients, it's not just the MNT, it is a three prone thing. So we are looking at MNT, physical activity or exercise, and then the medications that they are on. So we need to get the data from the health facilities to be able to come out with that. Thank you. Okay, thank Hello, you very Abby. much, Adi. Um, okay. Hello. Okay. So someone want to find out if a patient's sugar is high, should they still give fruit? If the sugar is very high, should they still continue to eat fruit? Is that a question? Give. Yeah. Oh, Evelyn, I missed you. Yes, ah, please. Yeah. Hello, RD. Yes, can you repeat the question again? Hello, RD. Yes, please, can you repeat the question again? Okay, so please, if the person's sugar is high, should you still give fruit? Uh, if the person's blood sugar level is still high, should you still go ahead and give fruits? Yes, please. You can do, go ahead and give fruits. Now, the fruits also have fibers in them. And also, bear in mind, you are giving fruits in terms of portion sizes or servings. So that will not go to add on, or to, that will not go a long way to spike their sugar level up. But rather, the fibers in the fruits may help control the release of the sugars into the blood. And that will also help them to uh, um, um, control their sugar level. So yes, the fact that the blood sugars are high does not mean that fruit intake should not be given. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so this one is in line with the meal timing you spoke about. So this is the question. Please then, the meal timing wouldn't be in line for the interval between supper and the next morning, which is breakfast. If I got you right, it's regular timing intervals you were referring to, like four to five hours between breakfast and lunch, and also same between lunch and supper. So the question is, yes, I don't get the question, but then again, that is it. So between breakfast and lunch, there should be a consistent meal timing. That should also go with between lunch and supper. Okay. What happens between supper and the following breakfast? The body is at rest, it's not spending that much of energy. And so you can't do much about it. Okay, so that one, that factor doesn't come in. But when you are really, um, you are really awake and active, we are saying that your timing should be consistent in terms of your food intake. And so if you are eating your breakfast at eight, it should be consistent with that. And then if your next meal is four hours away or five hours away, that should also be consistent. Same for lunch and then supper. So that is how you'll be able to help manage the sugars. Because then again, you are eating consistent amount of carbohydrates at consistent meal times. So these two go a long way to help control the sugars. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Okay, we have the last two questions. So, 
Obesity is a risk factor for DM. And now more obese clients are also engaged in intermittent fasting. Please, Ardi, I would like to know if it is advised to do that. Wow, so thank you, Sarah. Uh, so we'll say that for your obese diabetic clients, I'm sure you set goals with them as to want, wanting them to lose a bit of weight. So with that one, I will agree with you that indeed, intermittent fasting may not help them in a way because you are, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are, you set a certain goal, losing a certain amount of weight within a certain period of time. So it is best for them not to engage in fasting because for, for some, if they may, if they, they, they can't withstand hunger pants and they may end up eating heavy the following or the, the, when the time comes for them to eat after the fasting. So it is very important that yes, you sit your clients down and let them know the goal that you have set together with them and what you want to achieve so that intermittent fasting can be done after you have realized your uh, uh, weight loss goals. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ardi. So we'll take the very last two questions and we'll be done here. Okay, so please, what are your thoughts on DM clients consuming fruits before bedtime? Yes, thank you very much. So like I said, it is not just about the fruits, but it's about the quantity they sit to eat. That is more important to us. So I will say that yes, Snacking on fruits and vegetables is an optional thing, but if your clients have frequent hypo and they will want to use the fruits as snacks to help control that, that is okay. There's nothing wrong with giving them a portion controlled amount of fruits to take before bed, that is fine. So you have to have an interval. At what time do they sleep? And what time can they have that particular snack? because it is very important that we space their sleeping um, and, and, and time to their last meal intake. At least if you have about an hour or two before they sleep, they can take that bedtime snack around that time. So that is key. So if they sleep around 10 o'clock, then ideally around 8, 8.30, a fruit or a serving of fruit is okay for them and it will not have any impact on their glycemic level. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ardi. So we are taking this question from Della and Benis, then that will be it. Okay, so from Della, how can shift workers achieve appropriate meal time, especially night workers? Yes, so with them, you need to still, they need to still strategize with the, the dietitian in charge or the nutritionist who is caring for them to find out what times they go for their night shifts and what times they are, they, are, they are sleeping when they come back. So it's all about working with the client. It's not um, an imposition, but then you space the intervals in such a way that it goes a, a long way to help them manage their sugars very well. So yes, night shifts, we can always work around the times for them. While some people are sleeping, they are now working. And whilst others are working, they are now sleeping. So you can vary the time period and make sure that the interval between, between which they eat their food is not so close to, to, to each other, such a way that they, 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 they end up spiking their sugar, blood sugar level up. So is the, is the dietitian who must then work with the timing, do the, 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 the timing that the night shift gives them. Thank you. Thank you, Ardi. Okay, so this one from Benis. If yes, to if yes, to give fruits because of the fibers they contain, respective of their sugar levels. Do give any fruits because some fruits have higher I GI. Yeah. Yes, so that is very important. That's why I, on the slide on glycemic index and glycemic load, I said that. The research or the literature says that there's, there are mixed 
results when it comes to the usage of glycemic index or glycemic load. Some research says there is a high, there's a, a association between high intake of or intake of high glycemic index foods and sugar level. Others are saying there is nothing like that. There's no association. So the best thing is that yes, to be on the safer side, you can give them the fruits that has low glycemic index level, and that could go a long way not to spike their sugar level up. If you need to give them a high glycemic index food on the slide, I said you need to combine with a low glycemic index food so that then it becomes an intermediate uh, glycemic index food for them to have. And that will also not, um, 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 that will also help them to control their uh, sugar level. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. So we are taking the very last one. Hey, From um, Hamzarachi. Oh, okay. Uh, hello. Hello. Good evening. Good, good evening, senior. Hey. Hey, Jonathan, yes. well done. An insightful Thank presentation. Thank you. Though I didn't join, um, I joined latter part yes. uh, because of the time, yes. So, yeah. but the latter part, I've really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Uh, that was an insightful presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, so I, I just want to, it's just a, a comment and then a contribution. First of all, I want to commend the, the Zona executives for a very good job done. And you as a resource person, thank you very much. Thank you. Then secondly, it's about um, the, the glycemic index, glycemic load. The, the, as R.D. Jonathan rightly said, there are so many studies that has proven, yes, we have high glycemic load foods and index foods, but the end result is load. And what happens with the load? It, you don't eat that food in just, uh, you don't eat just one food in isolation. So in effect, you need to combine with foods that will help even if you are eating the high uh, high glycemic uh, index foods, you combine with other foods and then you get the, the best results. Then um, about the intermittent fasting also, yes, you know intermittent fasting is um, prove, uh, the studies, several studies have proven positive effects on the weight loss and intermittent fasting. But let's ask ourselves as professionals, for how long will your client continue to fast intermittently? Is it going to be a lifelong lifestyle? Remember, weight management, dietary intervention is a lifestyle something. So when you start, it is something that when you start, you have to continue. So if your client starts with the intermittent fasting and you have set your goals, at the end of the day, if you, if, if, if you achieve even 50% of your goals and your clients go back, stop the intermittent fasting, go back to the old lifestyle again, you still not, you've still not done, uh, done anything because it will cost 90 work. So intermittent fasting is uh, something that you will not say it is a permanent um, dietary uh, regimen that you want to recommend for your clients. But your clients who are already in, when they come and they ask for guidance, you help them do it well. And you help them maintain or you help them arrive or get to you 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 work with them to you get to the desirable goal 
that you have set together with your clients. So yes, please, the intermittent fasting, as RDs, it is our duty to help our clients do it the right way in order not to lose out key nutrients. And then also you let them understand that it is not a permanent thing. If it is going to be the lifestyle, which is not feasible. Then finally, I read Jonathan, consistency, consistency, consistency. He kept mentioning consistent, consistency, consistency. So consistency in your meal timings, consistency in your portion sizes play great role when it comes to diabetes management. Thank you very much for giving me this space. And once again, I want to congratulate the Zona executives and then RD Jonathan. Thank you very much once again. Thank you very much for your input as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, RD Jonathan. And thank you for that insightful answers to our question. And so now we invite the Zona coordinator to tell us. Oh, okay, thank you everyone and good evening to you all. Good evening. And thanks to uh, RD Jonathan for this insightful presentation. Uh, I hope we've all learned something. So I'm, I'm just going to be quick here because we are far behind time. So our next CPD uh, will be on innovative complementary feeding. And that will be on the 16th of May, 1 p.m. It will be done by Mr. Ntifafa Global. Yeah, so 1 p.m. on the 16th, we'll meet again. Okay, okay, thank, thank you very, very much. much. That's, that's it. Our zone now coordinator. coordinator. Okay, so we are bringing this okay, so we, we, we are bringing this when we want to come forward to work for half an hour. Thank you all. Bye. I'm the Jonathan. Bye bye. I'm the Yanda. With you, please. Same here. Same here. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Martha. We also thank our. We also thank our speaker for his ability. We also thank the organizer for his ability for this workshop. And thank you, everyone, for your cooperation. Thank the organizer. Let's have a good prayer for working so okay well. and so father we thank you for this time bye bye you i did you nothing for, for this insightful workshop so we pray that whatever let's have the, the closing of our career. please in the name of the uh, Father, we in thank you for the thank you. We need the slides. We've not had the formal, the, the very first slide that we uh, presentation. We don't have the slide, so please send the presentations to us. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the slides will be shared. Yeah. Okay. The previous okay, one as well. Thank you all. Have a good night. Yeah, sleep well.